All right, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the world famous Prospect Avenue podcast. I am your host, Chris Baker, here in the bunker in lovely Hamburg, New York. Normally lovely Hamburg, New York. Data recording Sunday, December 3rd, 2023. The snowfall that we had just south of Buffalo earlier in the week has been replaced by torrential downpours. So huge puddles everywhere. I got two wet dogs trampling through the house. Some pump is working overtime, just dispatching all that water out of the pit. But I'm committed to working equally hard here for the next 30 minutes or less, bringing you the latest and greatest on everything that's been happening in the world of the Buffalo Sabres prospects. But before we get to that, some quick housekeeping issues here. Uh, if you could, please like the video, subscribe to the YouTube channel if you haven't already, or if you're listening on an audio platform, please follow the podcast and download the latest episode. Every little bit helps here as we try to make this podcast as successful as possible, both this show as well as the Baker Fairburn hockey show that I do every week with Matthew Fairburn from The Athletic. You can find that on its own feed on Apple, Spotify, wherever you get your podcast, as well as right here on the Sabres Prospects YouTube channel. Truly grateful, though, for all the downloads, all the engagement that we get, the comments, the likes, the subscriptions, what have you. So um, want to keep the momentum going. And I'm done groveling. I'm done groveling. But uh, a fun little thing that we like to do is ask a question every now and then that you can put uh, your answer to the question in the comment section below. And this week's question is very simple. I want to know what you want for Christmas. I'm always curious what the wants and needs are of the audience for this show. And uh, I always like having fun reading your answers. And it could be anything. I don't know if you want a 3D printer. That seems like a pretty fun toy. Um, a lathe, a chainsaw. I don't know. Maybe you want something hockey related. Maybe you want a new pair of skates. Maybe you want a 30 goal score for the Sabres. Maybe you think Santa Claus can deliver a Stanley Cup under your tree. Any answer is fair game. I always have fun going through them. And if you could tell me what you want for Christmas, um, it'd be fun just sitting back late at night, scrolling through the comments and seeing what those answers are. Okay, enough goofing around. We got a lot to get to this week and we're going to jump right in and we're going to start in the Quebec Major Junior Hockey League this week with an update on big six foot three right shot defenseman Sevalad Komarov. If you recall in previous episodes of Prospect Avenue, we've talked about the down year that Quebec was expected to have coming off the Memorial Cup victory last year. And that's been the case. The Remparts find themselves in last place in the QMJHL Eastern Conference. And along the way, we've been thinking that Komarov could be a guy that could be up for grabs before the QMJHL trade deadline. And it seems that the Sevalad Komarov sweepstakes have come to an end. Reports out of Quebec this weekend have stated that Quebec and Drummondville have reached a deal that would send Komarov to the first place Voltageur. Drummondville currently in first place in the QMJHL's Western Conference. So that could be a pretty good deal for Komarov to go from worst to first and find himself back in a uh, pretty significant playoff race here before he ends his junior career. So Komarov, no doubt, one of the QMJHL's top defenders. Um, he's got the size to shut down top forwards. He's got the range and the sense to contribute offensively and spice up a power play. This is a guy that plays regularly over 25 minutes a night. Um, like I said, he's pretty offensive through 22 games. He has three goals and 16 assists this year. He's averaging about three shots on goal per game. And he brings a very strong physical element to the table. He's currently second in the queue with 51 penalty minutes, likes to bump and grind his way around the defensive zone. He's uh, big into self-sacrifice, gets down to block shots. So he's got that warrior mentality. But again, he does a little bit of everything at the junior level. So with the QMJHL trade period, it opens on December 17th and it closes on January 6th. So kind of curious to see news of this deal done this early. Again, it's December 3rd here, so a good two weeks before the trade period opens. But I think, I'm, I'm pretty sure that they don't have to wait actually to get this deal done with Komarov being an import. I think there's a different rule there. I, you know, it's going to depend on what the package is coming back from Drummondville to Quebec. 
but it seems like this is imminent that this deal is going to be done. I mean, even today on the date of recording here, again, December 3rd, Quebec and Drummondville are playing in a game as I'm recording this and Kamarao has been left out of the lineup. I think that tells us that the deal um, is pretty much going to be finalized and wrapped up here very soon. And with um, a 20 year old also, I think being part of the package with Komarov again, those two elements lead me to believe that they're um, free to make the deal before the trade period opens on December 17th. It could be wrong. I guess we'll find out, but either way um, the best teams in the QMJHL are going to start loading up. Uh, you know, the better teams in the Q this year are definitely in the East, you know, Bay Como is running away with the Eastern conference right now, but Moncton and Halifax are probably going to be expected to be loading up. Bay Como, Moncton, and Halifax, I'm pretty sure, are the only three QMJHL teams that are presently in the CHL top 10. I'd have to check that. I don't want to check that on the fly. I'm pretty sure that's the case. But, um, you know, here we are, Drummondville leading the West, and they're going to be looking to fend off uh, Victoriaville, Roy Naranda. So good to see them loading up, and they add another big body and a big right shot to their top four to join uh, Maverick Lamoureux. Maverick Lamoureux, kind of the, the leading man on Drummondville's blue line right now, big, long uh, first round draft pick of the Arizona Coyote. So they've, uh, Drummondville's picked up a really nice piece here and a do it all player with Komarov. And we'll be excited to see what shakes out for him as he makes a transition to Drummondville here in the second half of the season. Something we'll definitely be monitoring as it takes shape. So we're going to stay in the CHL and we have to do a quick update on Matthew Savoy and, and kind of what I was saying last week uh, on episode 11 of this podcast, we're coming up on a Baker's dozen. Wow. I can't believe you're getting me to do 12 of these. But as we mentioned on episode 11, not going to go real deep on Savoy every week. It's expected that he's going to dominate the Western league. And, and that's what he's been doing. Um, had another hat trick this week. Uh, he just kind of keeps cruising along. You know, if his, intensity level wanes, you know, we'll call it out, but right now, so far, so good. He's committed back checking. He's, uh, you know, being a puck hound, like we saw when he was in Rochester, he's doing everything right. And just wanted to report on that, but kind of the topic of discussion this week that I just wanted to get to with Savoy is that I guess a reminder, you know, he should only be worrying about the things that he controls. He can't control the NHL CHL agreement. He can't control the level of competition that he's forced to play at this year at the junior level, but he can control his effort. He can control his ability to dominate. And that's again, what he's been doing um, through nine games. Savoy is up to 10 goals and 10 assists. He has two hat tricks along the way that have led to one five point game and one four point game. He leads the entire Canadian hockey league. So that's the Q, the OHL, the WHL with 2.22 points per game. So, Immediate impact, as expected, since going back to Wenatchee. He's a clearly a step ahead of the WHL competition. There's no question about it. Um, he'd ideally be a guy that can play in the AHL this year, but he can't. That's not in the cards unless there's an, an emergency recall. If you recall a couple of years ago when Brendan Gooley was in Prince Albert, um, he was able to come up to Buffalo on an emergency recall. Maybe Savoy can get one of those after the World Juniors. We'll see. But either way, it's, it's Wenatchee for the rest of the year, let's face it. But I know there's a thought out there that this is kind of like a waste of a season developmentally for Savoy. And I understand why people want to say that Seth Appert himself kind of said, look, he should be here in Rochester. It's the best for his development, but unfortunately he can't. So he's forced to be back in the Western league, but there are a couple things that I think are worth pointing out with Savoy that I think would breed a deep level of engagement, um, a commitment every night. And the first thing is the world juniors. He's going to be playing a leading role for team Canada at the world junior championship. And Canada has Sweden and Finland in their group this year. The intensity should be ratcheted up quite a bit with those two teams in there. I mean, Latvia and Germany are also in the group. He could probably toy with guys against Latvia and Germany. Um, much like he's often able to do at the Western hockey league level, but he's not going to be able to do that against Sweden and Finland. So that'll be good for the intensity and, and getting him to raise his game and, and keep everything sharp. The other piece of the puzzle here is making sure that he stays healthy and engaged into April and May when the WHL playoffs begin. If you go back 
last season. Savoy and the Winnipeg Ice, they suffered a massive letdown, losing to Seattle in the Western Hockey League Championship Series. So perhaps the goal of ending his junior career with a Memorial Cup is another lever, you know, that'll provide some fuel, keep some fire in his belly to just make sure he's consistently firing and preparing for each game like a professional. So I just wanted to call those two things out because I, again, I understand why there's a disappointment in fans that Savoy is back in the Western hockey league, but maybe all is not lost. If he can, again, um, use the world juniors and that pursuit of a Memorial cup to keep his intensity high, not take any nights off and get better and get better and just take on that leadership role and put a lot on his plate. So um, we will be monitoring that, but I don't want to go deep every week on Savoy. He's going to clean it up statistically. And that's exactly what's been going on thus far. Again, 2.22 points per game, 10 goals, 10 assists at nine games. Um, maybe he could get to a hundred points, even in the shortened season. I mean, he's going to miss a good chunk of games at the world juniors, but I think right now it, he, he's probably going to statistically fall a little short of that, but man, if he can get to a hundred points at a shortened season, that'd be pretty incredible. And he certainly has the talent to do it. And he certainly has the line mates to do it as well. So with that said, um, that's enough about Savoy. He's crushing it statistically anyways, world junior news. Um, also I think we should probably provide some notes on a couple other guys that are expected to be there. We'll start with Michigan state freshman defenseman, Maxim Sturbach. Uh, this week, he was officially named to Slovakia's preliminary roster. No surprise there. He's a highly decorated international performer for the Slovaks. Uh, Sturbach's probably going to wear the captain's C on his jersey for Slovakia this year. So no surprise there to see him, but had to mention that he was formally named to the preliminary roster and barring... Uh, an injury or some unforeseen crazy circumstance, he will be playing a big role for the Slovaks when the tournament begins on December 26th. If we go over to Sweden, uh, we haven't talked about that here officially, but uh, Noah Ostlin, um, he's been off the ice here for a couple weeks. In a game against Linköping back on this, uh, November 18th, he didn't come out for the third period. He took a couple of hard knocks against the boards in that game against Lin Chiping. So he's missed the last two weeks of action. Uh, he's been out of lineup for five games with a concussion as it turns out. So I've been referring to it as an upper body injury reports in Sweden have confirmed that it is a concussion. So that's not good news. That is not good news. Um, for Oslin personally, for the Sabres who are really paying close attention, to his development, and uh, certainly not good news for uh, for Sweden. They've already lost one of their top defensemen, Cali Odelius, to a broken ankle. So now the potential to lose Noah Oslin could be a tough pill for the Swedes to swallow. We'll be keeping an eye on that. Oslin was having a decent season, I would say. Um, he had to get acclimated to the system in Vekwa, then started really producing some points and really looked at, uh, at home in that offensive attack. So now he's been off the ice for a couple of weeks and that's no bueno. So we'll be um, keeping track of what's going on with Oslin there with Sweden looking to open the world junior camp on December 13th. So still 10 days. He's been off the ice for two weeks now since the injury. And, you know, maybe in another 10 days, he could be back up, get a full bill of health and get back on the ice when Sweden opens their camp in 10 days time. But if Oslin can't go for whatever reason, and again, we, we, there's plenty of time to get him healthy and right for the world juniors. But if he can't go, maybe that presents an opportunity for a player like Anton Wahlberg. So we might as well give you a quick update on what Wahlberg's been doing. Uh, we update you regularly on how he's been playing with the Malmo Redhawks as a second line winger. He's been doing very well this year. Um, Wahlberg came out, you know, he, what I've noticed with him real quick is that he seems to be a quick starter in games. Um, he did that again on Saturday in a 3-1 loss to Timra. Came out, had a really good scoring opportunity in the game's first minute. And then later on in the second period, early in the second period, buried his third goal of the year to end his 10-game point drought that he was experiencing with Malmo. So what I've seen from him, though, he's consistently gotten better and better this year. Good retriever of pucks. He's a very trusted uh, player. They're putting him out there in all situations with Mamo. He sees the ice very well. I love his slot presence, big body, likes to 
um, you know, wind pucks in the corners and the boards, he kicks him high, and then he gets to the net quickly. And that's how he scored his goal on Saturday was, you know, using his big body to be right down low around the net and took a short pass and buried it um, for his third goal of the season. So Malmo themselves, they started off really well this year. And then they've now lost five of their last six games. So they've slipped down to 12th place in the 14 team SHL. So, you know, opinions are all over the place for Wahlberg. I don't know if I'm being a homer or maybe just using the bias because I see him a lot, maybe more so than uh, a lot of Sweden's other world junior hopefuls. But I think he's got a, a spot on this team. I know others aren't fully convinced, but I think he's there firmly. I guess we'll find out. In short order here again, Sweden's camp opens on the 13th and they'll announce their world junior training camp roster uh, well in advance of that camp opening date. Another quick note, while we're talking about Malmo, uh, Wahlberg's teammate and fellow Sabres prospect, William von Barnikow, he was moved off the top line. That happened in a game against Moto back on November 18th, mid-game. They took him off the line. I, I didn't even see him out there, actually, for any shifts in the third period. But he's been playing mostly third and fourth line in the last handful of games. So he's experienced a significant reduction in ice time uh, over the last four games or so. Uh, this is a player. He was averaging about 16 or 17 minutes when he was playing up with Yanni Kukin and Lori Payanemi. He's now down. Uh, in the 12, 12 and a half minutes per game range. So he has some work to do to get him, himself back up the lineup. But again, Malmo, they've lost five to six and they've been slipping down the standing. So maybe they might want to put Von Barnikow back up. Um, we'll see how that goes with him. Uh, let's see what else do we want to get to this week here about halfway through the time that I wanted to spend this week. So we better keep this train going. I guess back to another world junior hopeful, might as well talk about Topias Leinenen real quick. As mentioned last week, Leinenen fully recovered from the lower body injury that delayed his start to the season. And he had two rehab starts, we'll call them, with Kupa of Finland's second division. He showed his potential. I watched both of those games, showed his potential in those rehab starts. So he completed his uh, loan to Kupa two Fridays ago, uh, played a game against Jokerit, stopped 23 of 27 in a loss, and then moved himself back to Uvescula and rejoined JYP. So he gets back to JYP, gets a couple practices under his belt, and they were going through a flu bug. They had a rash of injuries, and they had a Tuesday game. So this past Tuesday, JYP had to play the best team in Liga, Ilves Tampere. And not a good situation when you're battling injuries and a flu bug. So they gave Lanin in that start. So Lanin's first Liga start of the year was against the best team in the league. And as you can imagine, with a banged up roster and a lot of young guys uh, uh, playing in front of him, it didn't go super well. He escaped the first period by giving up one goal. It was a shot, you know, high slot, um, clean look. Could have been stopped, so that one got past him, but then the wheel started to come off late in the second period. Uh, Ilf scored three goals in the last four minutes. They go to the second intermission, and then Ilf gets a power play, and they they get a fifth goal on lane and in, in the first, you know, within like just over three minutes into the third period. So lane and in got the hook in that one. So played just over 43 minutes, gave up five goals on 20 shots, but I have to tell you, you know, the goals that he allowed, they were uncontested shots with the exception of that first one that was scored from range. The other four were from like right at the doorstep, uh, uncontested looks, wide open guys at the side of the net, you know, could he have gotten, um, part of his body on some of the shots? Sure. He could have, but I mean, these were uncontested looks, just a rough go, uh, that, you know, JYP was overmatched against the best team in the league, not the best conditions to get Lane in, in his first start by any means. And it didn't go very well. So I wanted to mention that because he had one start coming off the injury with JYP's under 20 team. Then they had the international break. Then he gets the two rehab starts in QPA and again, showed potential, made some nice saves, but also allowed, I think it was eight or nine goals in those two starts. 
And then he goes and he lets in five on 20 shots and gets the hook in his first league of start. So it has been pretty bumpy for Lane trying to get some momentum going, coming off the injury. And this is a guy that's one of the most hyped junior age goaltenders that Finland has, but he hasn't been part of the international program here since really going back to the, the under 18s in his draft year. So I think Finland had high hopes for him, but it's been a tough road thus far. And, you know, for me, I think they can put him on their world junior team, at least as a third, but it's really hard to say how they're going to handle it. Um, for me, even though he hasn't a lot of runway, I'd like to see him be in their camp. Finland's camp opens December 15th. They have two uh, exhibition games that they're going to play. And then they're going to announce their roster. Hopefully they can get Lane in there. I think it'd be very big for his development, but also his confidence to just reset his development, get him back with his peer group and see what he can do there. So more to come on that. We'll be uh, watching closely for Finland when they release their world junior camp roster here in the coming week. Also in Finland, we might as well stay here real quick. Um, a non-world junior hopeful uh, is on golden helmet watch. So, the golden helmet is worn every game by the team's leading scorer. And we're on golden helmet watch with Viljami Mariala in TPS. So the playmaking Mariala, he's come on really well here since November 15th, picking up two goals and 10 points in his last dozen games. Liga plays a 60 game schedule. Mariala is 28 games in to the schedule and he has 17 points through, through those 28 games. But he's one point behind the team's leading scorer, Marcus Nermi. Nermi has 18 points. Again, Mariala has 17. So, uh, oh, it's fun, you know, to see the guy out there with the golden helmet. Mariala is still just 20 years of age, very young player, great playmaker, doing very well as a second line centerman in Finland's top professional league. So, always want to call that out. Really liked what I've seen from Mariala this year. His contract uh, only goes through this season. The Sabres would hold his rights uh, through next season as well. So, you know, they could always sign him and loan him back to Liga if they wanted to stash him in Europe for another year before bringing him over. Not sure how they view Mariala, but I mean, the playmaking aptitude is there. I think he's getting better off the puck. I've mentioned that on previous episodes of Prospect Avenue. So we'll see where his development goes. But wanted to call that out because if you remember tracking R2 Roots Aligning years ago when he was in Tampere, he was a guy that had the golden helmet quite a bit, and it would be nice to see another Sabres prospect wearing that dome, that golden dome out there in Liga action. So we'll see if he can get it done. And it wouldn't be an episode of Prospect Avenue without an update on Seska winger Prokhor Poltapov. Poltapov continues to deploy his aggressive style with Seska, bull in a china shop, likes to get to the net, go hard on the forecheck, plays a game at the high rate of speed. And while he's doing all that, the points have just absolutely dried up for Poltapov after his quick statistical start. So Poltapov's last goal was nearly two months ago. So he's amidst a 20-game goal drought right now. Not good. He had a four-game point streak in early October. That ended on October 19th. And he hasn't had a point since then. So he is amidst not only a 20-game goal drought, but a 17-game point drought. He's been playing in the middle of the lineup. He's been getting minutes, 13, 14, 15 minutes a night, uh, until just today on Sunday. And I have the game recorded. I haven't been able to go through it yet. I don't know if it was because of injury or game conditions. I'll have to confirm that next week when we get together here on prospect Avenue, but he came out on Sunday and he skated for just a season low five minutes and 35 seconds of action. So his role on the team has been inconsistent. Uh, his ice time is now becoming inconsistent, but despite the slump with Seska, Poltapov has been officially named to Russia's under 25 roster for the upcoming channel one cup. That tournament will be played December 14th through the 17th in St. Petersburg, Russia. Now China was going to be bringing a team to this event, but they've dropped out. So it's going to be Kazakhstan, Belarus, Russia's under 25 team that Poltapov will be a part of and replacing China will be a second Russian team made up of some, I think it'd be a sprinkling of stars from the KHL as well as some, an all-star team from the Supreme league, their second division in Russia. So, uh, that'll be fun. Look, 
you know, Poltapov, he's not going to get the opportunity internationally to play against the likes of the Czechs and the Finns and the Swedes, like Russia normally would do as part of the European hockey tour. But um, he's going to get an international look nonetheless against Belarus, Kazakhstan, and some Russian comrades for the second Russian team at the Channel One Cup. I should have access to those games. And uh, they have like, I think, 20 forwards on the roster. So I don't know if he's going to get to play in all three of those games. But needless to say, looking forward to reporting back on how Poltapov looks in that environment. Maybe getting him out of that Seska environment for a little bit. We'll do wonders for his game. We shall see. We're going to finish up this week's episode of Prospect Avenue just with some random housekeeping notes. Uh, last episode, we talked about Scott Retzlaff in the Seattle Thunderbirds of the Western League. Uh, last episode, he was coming off back-to-back 40-plus save performances. And immediately after that episode was released, he went out in his very next start and posted a 19th save shutout for his first shutout of the year. So Retzlaff, has, um, he's maintained his high level since the last episode of Prospect Avenue, and he's worked his save percentage up to the 90% threshold. So if you recall, a little bit of a rough start to the year for Ratzlaff. He was, you know, 86% save percentage, got it up to 87, 88, and it was steadily improving. He has since gotten it up to 90%. So that's good to see. And he's been elevating his play at the right time. Ratzlaff was a guy that participated in Hockey Canada's Zoom meetings over the year in anticipation of Canada building their World Junior Championship roster for the 2024 event. So he's firmly in the mix. He's elevating his play at the right time. Uh, with Hockey Canada, they, they're probably just a, a day or two away from announcing their selection camp roster. So we'll see if Scott Ratzlaff is indeed invited to camp. For me, I think the play is he could at the very least be a number three for Canada this year, get him on the roster, get him the experience of being with the team. And it's really a play for him to be one of the top two net miners for Canada at the 2025 tournament. We'll see. You never know. I think Canada's goaltending situation is wide open for the world junior championship this year. And for all we know with his play moving in a good direction recently in Seattle, maybe rats laughs a guy that gets a couple starts and gets uh, enters camp with some momentum. You never know. But needless to say, wanted to put a plug in there for how well he's been doing and hopefully he can take a run at that world junior spot this year. We'll go to Rochester real quick. Can't do an episode of Prospect Avenue with uh, talking about Yuri Kulik. He had that one game sniff in the NHL, got some decent minutes, but then was sent back down to Rochester. And with Isak Rosane still up in Buffalo, uh, averaging a, a little over what, nine and a half minutes or so, he's still up in Buffalo. Kulik's back with the Amherst, centering a line with a now healthy Linus Weisbach and Lucas Rusek. Kulik came out Saturday night and scored both of the Amherst goals in a 4 2 loss to Belleville. Had a nice uh, power play bomb from the right side and then had a, a nice even strength goal later in the game. Uh, puck battle in the corner. Kulik just shoves his checker to the ice and then works his way to the front of the net and takes a nice feed from Rusek for the goal. Nice play all the way around from both Rusek and Kulik. But uh, with the two goals, it gets Kulik back up to 13 through 18 games. He's one off the AHL lead in the goals department. So he just keeps grooving away there down on the farm. Oh, what else do we want to get to this week? Oh, Carl Skuga, right-handed defenseman, Albert Lacassin. We haven't talked about him a lot this year here on Prospect Avenue, but he buried his first two goals of the season on the power play using his big right-handed shot from the blue line. So that was good to see. You could check both of those goals out on last week's uh, highlights package that was posted on the Sabres Prospects YouTube channel if you haven't already. Let's see. Steven Sardarian, we can talk about him real quick. He is still on the top line for the University of New Hampshire. He snapped a seven-game goal funk on Friday night in a 5-2 loss to Maine. Sardarian, if you recall, last week we talked about him as a guy that we want to see shooting the puck more. That's still the case. He had just two shot attempts in the loss to Maine. Both of those shot attempts were on the power play. So we're going to be looking for more from Sardarian as he goes here throughout this season. But it was good to see him get off the schneid with the goal on Friday. Also getting off the schneid, uh, Joel Radkovich-Bernson. 
playing with FPS in Finland's second division. Bernson was out of the lineup for a little bit here, nursing a wrist injury. He came back and sniped a really nice goal off the rush on Friday. So wanted to get a plug in for JRB. We haven't talked about him a lot this year. And I think last but not least, uh, Kingston Frontenac's winger, Ethan Miedema, he notched goals in back-to-back games last week for the first time this season. He's another player. Uh, we want to see him shooting the puck more. He's averaging just two shots on goal per game. But Miedema now is up to eight goals on the year. Half of those have come with the man advantage. So, again, want to see him work himself into scoring position more often, find the space to get his great release off more. I think he needs a little time to get that shot off. So we'll be, we'll be monitoring to see how Meadham is doing here as the season progresses as well. Young player, power forward, great shot, just needs to get it off more often. I think that's it. We're at the 30-minute mark. This is kind of the allotted time that I want to use every week to talk prospects before you guys get bored with me. But um, once again, like the video if you haven't already. Subscribe to the channel. Truly appreciative of you stopping by Prospect Avenue every week. Oh, again, let me know in the comments what you want for Christmas. Seriously, I'm, I'm really eager to see what you guys are expecting under the tree from Santa Claus or whatever holiday you celebrate. I should say that, right? But at any rate, that's enough of my blabbering. I'm Chris Baker. Thanks for stopping by Prospect Avenue. We'll see you again next week.